Good. Welcome to Talk Real in London. We're filming here in Hackney uh, a few weeks before the UK referendum on membership of the European Union coming up on the 23rd of June. It's the first time since 1975 that people in this country will be able to decide uh, whether to remain part of the European Union and potentially, if they vote to leave, the first time that a member state has made that option and has left the Union. Uh, the only close precedent is the precedent of Greenland in 1985, which chose after a referendum to uh, leave the European Union. But of course, Greenland is not, was not a member state. It's not a state in its own right. It's a part of Denmark. So the situation is slightly diff different. Uh, here to discuss that uh, with me, to try and bring out some of the broader uh, <coughs> messages about what democracy in Europe means today, is change possible uh, in Europe today and how, uh, are four uh, excellent guests. Um, going round the table, they are Marina Prentoulis, a member of Syriza uh, here in London and a member of the campaign Another Europe is Possible. Federico Campagna, a philosopher, writer and an editor, uh, also living in London. James Schneider, uh, one of the uh, people working with the Momentum campaign, a Momentum organisation that grew out of the campaign to get Jeremy Corbyn elected as the leader of the Labour Party, and Ulrika Gero um, from European Democracy Lab and the author of a forthcoming book uh, called The European Republic. Uh, welcome to all of you. Um, Marina and Federico, I'd like to maybe start with you because um, this referendum's coming up potentially has big implications uh, for UK citizens, for European citizens, and more generally, your uh, two European citizens living in the UK. Um, since you're not British nor from a Commonwealth country, um, you won't have the right to vote if you were from Cyprus or Malta uh, to Commonwealth countries, you would have the right to vote, but you're not. Um, so I wanted to ask you, in the context of this referendum that's coming up, how are you positioning yourselves? Uh, how does it make you feel? Because it potentially has some big impacts for you. Maybe Marina, let's yes. start with you. In, and it's not only me and you, it's 2.4 million people, I think, that they're living in uh, Britain and they won't have the right to vote. So there is a petition going around, and I think I have signed it, I definitely have publicized it, which should give us a right to vote for this referendum, because our life after the referendum could change dramatically. We are European citizens, I've been living in Britain for 20 years, and I think I should have a right um, to vote in this referendum. But at the same time, the fact that I don't have a right to vote doesn't mean that I'm not involved with the referendum and the debate. As you said at the beginning, I'm involved with another Europe is Possible campaign. And what we are trying to do is open up a debate for the in part of the campaign, so we want to stay in the European Union, but we want to open a debate which will not be dominated by the two dominant positions that we have uh, from the right in Britain. So we are part of the campaign, we are trying to discuss the European Union, but from a, a leftist perspective and explain how we can go on fighting in the European Union and how we can change the European Union. Don't know if you Yeah, well, if, if I could vote, I would, I would certainly vote for the UK to stay in Europe. But there is, I mean, there's, there's some paradoxical aspects to this. One of them is that um, <clears throat> the idea behind Britain leaving the EU, um, or, or a strong element in it, doesn't have to do much with Britain as the people that live in Britain. It's Britain as an idea, as a kind of like imaginary, com imagine, imagine community, semi-ethnic identity and stuff. So in that sense, it makes sense from that perspective not to allow us to vote, because we're not British. Although I've been living here for 10 years, you've been living here for 20 years. But we would never become. Um, so I understand that from that, and that's exactly why I would vote for Britain to remain. Um, another aspect is that one advantage, I think, of the European solution is that the, the European Republic, or whatever you want to call it, the European area, is that it allows a certain degree of foreignness to everybody. So that the, the very idea of belonging you know, to the kind of blood and soil of Italy, Germany, Britain would, you know, would dissolve or at least kind of loosen up. Um, and so in that sense, it's, it's this strange paradoxical situation in which I would vote for Britain to remain as part of Europe in order to be allowed to remain as a foreigner here. So in order to kind of escape that idea of belonging and identity. Um, I think this is something that is not often kind of pointed out, that Europe allows for this degree of foreigners and goes beyond this point of identification. Um, 
and unfortunately that is a part, I think, of the kind of political discourse in Britain, very much. Thank you. James, maybe I could, I could come to you and ask, and ask this, that I guess for many people watching, um, particularly those outside of the UK, it may seem a little bit strange that anybody would consider leaving the European Union, or, or maybe not. So maybe the, the question is, um, what kind of reasons do you think are pushing some people to say uh, they want to leave? Um, and, and maybe to make a distinction between um, there's undeniably some degrees of, of xenophobia, fear of foreigners mixed up in the debate, but that's probably not the whole story. There's also some anger at the European Union for some of the things that it's done. So maybe you could try and explain. Uh, I think there are probably three broad camps. The, the first is the, um, the sort of entrepot state, Britain is Hong Kong. Um, it's, a, it's a way to reduce regulations, reduce workers' rights, become more financialised and be this sort of trading post that sits off Europe. It's not controlled by Europe. It doesn't have to deal with some of the social, environmental protections, but it can play its part with the rest of the world. And that's one bit of it, and that tends to be funded by hedge funds, and it's, it's got those sort of sets of interests. Then there is a, a more nostalgic uh, one, which is much more sent, uh, based in uh, belonging and identity, which is um, this idea that Britain sort of was great in this, it, generally it's intangible, this sort of intangible way that, that, that Britain was great and there needs to be a return to that in some way and Britain's sovereignty can organise itself on the world stage and, and that um, crosses over a bit more, I think, between left and right. And then I think there's a third one which can be, which tends to not speak for itself but can be mobilised for one of these two camps, which is the... Um, Europe doesn't work for us, we are left behind by the process that Europe has been part of this, the last sort of 30, 40 years, the development of uh, generally market liberal globalisation that has left behind large, you know, many groups of people and that can often be articulated through a xenophobia which more comes out of the second one but it also can be articulated through this idea that Britain could be this unique and different thing that is forward looking. Ulrika, um, as, has, as has been mentioned, uh, people have got different ideas of what the European Union is, what it should be, what it should become. Uh, and one of the possibilities that some people are saying the UK referendum opens up is the possibility to have a two-speed or even a multi-speed Europe, in fact, where there may be uh, different kinds of European integration to suit different groups of countries depending on their interests and the way they see it. Do you see that as a potentially positive uh, outcome of this referendum moment, um, the emergence of a two-speed Europe? First, a little footnote to what Federico said on who has the right to vote. I think it's legally probably still yet uncertain because we are basically on a legal thing here where we have a union of states and union of citizens in an ambivalence. Huh? That's the whole uh, uh, artif uh, artif uh, artifice of the Maastricht Treaty. So the very question whether the UK as a country can leave but the British people remain European citizens on an individual basis would be a very interesting legal case to fight for at the European Court. Yeah? At least, I mean, I'm not... A, I'm not a specialist, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, the duality of union of citizens and union of states could make that you leave as the country, but the country cannot determine its people to not be citizens of Europe. And whatever could be uh, looked for, but I think there's some interesting legal uh, things mm -hmm. here which uh, might be developed. Um, on the integration thing, sort of, uh, I come from Germany. Um, and it's very interesting to see that there is a twofold discussion. Uh, I would be somebody who is one of these convinced Europeans since 20 years, right? So yes, there were moments in time, first when we thought the Brits would finally do it, in 2001 was the Europe, because you had that discussion. May I remember that around 2000, 2001, the UK even wanted to join under Blair and, and to come to the Euro, and so we were all happy, and there was some Malo initiative, and the Brits were leading the security and defense issue of the European Union, so just be reminded that you were this, right? That's only 15 years ago. So it failed. And uh, since ever then, there were a couple of moments where, as a Franco-German sort of type of person uh, working on Eurozone integration, seeing the need of more Eurozone integration on the social and the democratic field, obviously we were a little bit uh, unnerved by the Brits, so to say. Like the Brits were always deadlocking, uh, torpedoing the Franco-German engine on, you know, Eurozone integration and so. So it was always this twofold situation to say, we love them, we want them to stay. There's such much, so much sort of what they bring to the 
Party, which is the best parliamentarism, uh, Magna Carta, you know, all this tradition of Britishness in the European Union, which obviously is important and was always important to, um, you know, like giving that triangular view on Franco-German relations. It's like a prism. You can, this, you know, if it gets too much social thing, then you need the British thing. And it was always played like billiard in this triade. But if it gets too much to a deadlock, then obviously it's not good. So do you find voices today in Germany, and I must say, unfortunately, open voices, who argue, let them leave. Because we in the continent, with the euro, we have different needs, different needs on democracy, different needs on, on the euro making. So the more they are out, the better, because then finally, perhaps we can do what we should do. The other question is, if you are leaving under the circumstances we are in in Europe, is this really a trigger for Eurozone integration? Are we still in a momentum where finally, because you leave, we finally could do what we ought have done, say, at least five years back, if not three years back, or are we beyond peak? Because there's a critical question to make that perhaps it would liberate that uh, speed Europe, uh, Eurozone versus the 28 or 27 by then. Um, but whether with the whole context of refugee crisis, populism and so, even if you leave, we take a momentum for more Eurozone integration in a democratic sense, may be put into question. Thank you. Um, the, the, the questions that are on the, the ballot paper, the two options, to stay uh, under the agreements that's being uh, negotiated by Cameron at the European Council or to leave, both look like rather conservative options um, in as much as the, the, the proposal uh, to stay uh, already in that agreement undercuts, for example, some rights for European migrants uh, living in the UK, uh, rights for third country nationals living in the UK, re-emphasises um, the economic trade dimension of, of uh, the European Union, doesn't talk at all about other kinds of issues. So um, the choice before the British people seems like a choice between two rather conservative options. Uh, I want to know what you, what you think of that and whether, if that is the case, what, what are the possibilities this referendum opens up for what I think most of us around this table are interested in, which is to try and move towards a more progressive Europe or another Europe, as, as your campaign uh, puts it. So maybe um, I come back to James um, to, to, to answer that question, perhaps also reflect on um, the different social forces also inside the UK um, that, are, that are pushing for another Europe, notably in England and in Scotland, for example. Yeah, um, they, they are two conservative options and it's very difficult to see how in the next few weeks a progressive force can rally behind one of these two and alter its, it, you know, its basis. Um, Remain is less reactionary than leave. That's the basis. It's, it, it, it's do you want to be stung by a bee or do you want to be stung by a wasp? And um, uh, definitely the, you know, the wasp one is, it unleashes a set of forces and demonstrates a dominance of a particular set of forces which are, which are more reactionary. But at the moment, the best arguments uh, from a sort of more left or social perspective uh, for, that are acceptable within the in discourse are, are basically liberal elitism. It's, um, uh, this is better for you, honest. Okay, you don't like it, but it is, going to be, it is going to be better for you. And it's dressed up in some of this talk about, if, for example, the, the, the Union of Citizens, Union of States. This is a, this is a language and understanding that it's not going to mobilize uh, masses of people. It, it doesn't speak to the, the social demands and the social, uh, social needs, which is why you have this interesting dynamic within um, British society and its relationship to Europe, where um, the lower down the socio-economic scale you go, the more opposition there is to Europe. Although, you know, uh, arguably, well, I, I would argue that the European Union, in even in its fairly limited social form, it could be hugely better. Provides um, uh, a lot of rights, a lot of freedoms, a lot of protections for um, for workers, social rights, and protections, environmental rights, and protections. Uh, so I think our, our opportunity now is that. This is bringing to the head the, the more conservative reactionary debate about Europe and it will be brought to a head and it will cause some confusion within that side of the argument once this is finished. And what I think we need to do now is begin to map out what we do on the 24th of 
uh, June, the day after the referendum, how do we start to build a social Europe, a democratic Europe, that, but it, that is actually rooted in British, English, Scottish, and so on, Welsh uh, identity. It, it, it's not this more abstract, more liberal thing, but it's something that's rooted in a common set of struggles, a common set of needs across, um, across people within Europe. And to come to that, this is what the Another Europe is about as well. It's not only about what is going to happen in the referendum, but as you said, what we are going on the 24th, how we go on to talk about a social Europe, to try to make changes, to create alliances, and to change the power dynamics that you have within the European Union. But, uh, I mean, I think one of the big problems with the referendum is the uh, level of the public debate, which we didn't actually have, and you have these conservative positions that they come and they talk about in, in economic terms about how much big businesses are going to lose or not lose, and they are not addressing the everyday <coughs> fears of the British people. And of course there is another problem there, that the European Union was never communicating very well in Britain and in other countries as well. So it's seen as something <coughs> out there and there is little knowledge uh, about that. So I think there is, there is a lack of a com communicative space, let's say, where we could have debates about the European Union, about how we can change it, about what it actually means. Um, to give you an example, I mean, what we hear in Britain quite often is that, oh, but the European Union is totally undemocratic. Well, there are elections. You, you, you may have a lot of criticisms. You may say it doesn't represent something or we should change something there. But there are elections and it seems that nobody is paying uh, any attention when these elections are taking place. It's something that it has a very low information value. Um, Enrico, you, you were shaking your head when I said that they were two <laughs> conservative options, but maybe you um, disagree. Yeah, well, because, I mean, there's, there's a couple of aspects I think one has to consider. First of all, why is the European Union so such a conservative option? What exactly about it is conservative right now? Because I think conservative is, is not the correct word, because conservatism, as applied to the, European, to the British con um, situation, applies to, for example, the specific rule of aristocracy, you know, and so on, a failed revolution about 500 years ago and all that kind of situation. Um, in, in Europe, the kind of conservatism, the right-wingism, um, is about neoliberalism. Now, where does neoliberalism come from into Europe? Where was it injected? Who injected it into Europe? From Britain. I mean, the, the great export of Britain into Europe was neoliberalism. That is why the financialization of Europe starts in its, more, in its contemporary form, starts from Britain. So that's the first kind of disclaimer. Uh, <clears throat> and so in a sense also if you, were, if you were to withdraw from Europe, you wouldn't withdraw to a place of purity, you would withdraw from the very place where all this started. We were making a <coughs> joke before that uh, you, we, have, we, we got our illness, neoliberalism, from Britain and then everybody is accusing the EU but now you are real and so on. Maybe so there were some Austrian economists who were involved somewhere. In the no, no, but, not. <laughs> but, but the new kind of Regan and Thatcher form, the kind of like the, the, the Anglo-American, uh, uh, anyway, that's The other is that the two options I don't think are equivalent. Um, I, mean, I mean it technically, as in everything has a, a set of possibilities inscribed to it, you know, to a lesser or greater extent. The possibilities inscribed in the European project are of a certain kind, and the possibilities inscribed in the British project within the Commonwealth, which by the way, I think it would be interesting to insert into the conversation, because if we're thinking of breaking up the European Union, why don't we break up the Commonwealth? I mean, if, if the left has problems with the European setup, what, <laughs> what, what should we say about the kind of, not even post-colonial, but straightly colonial way, I mean, neoliberally colonial project of the Commonwealth, that's aside. But so the, the, um, the possibilities inscribed are very different. I mean, with, with Europe, we are talking about something that has, for example, as the first idea that of the abolition of borders the free circulation of people, the idea of an integrated social welfare, and aspects, for example, that are, I think, central to the debate, which we should um, kind of bring back also to, to a certain extent to kind of a given understanding of what the libidinal energy in the European project is, which are, I think, some of the best aspects of the European cultural production, I think, especially about humanism, which I think uh, see as central. I mean, humanism is that which then brings the, the philosophical justification for the Human Rights Act for, you know, for the environmental protections and all these kind of things. Um, and th that possibility is inscribed in the European project, while it's not inscribed in the, in the British project. 
Thank you. Ulrika, one uh, aspect of the European heritage, which is not exclusively European, but nonetheless um, we could claim to be proud of, is tradition of democracy. Plenty of people um, across the European Union right at the moment somehow feel that the European Union is undemocratic. And that feeling undoubtedly has uh, a relationship with the fact that more and more referendums are springing up. There was famously the Greek referendum uh, last year. There'll be a referendum in just a month or so in Holland about the relationship with Ukraine. Uh, there's the UK referendum. More and more referendums. And people say, well, it's our only chance uh, to influence what the European Union is can, doing. Can, can I intervene before you come in? The Greek referendum, it wasn't about the membership of the European Union. It was no, about... Nor, is, nor is the Dutch referendum yeah. uh, next month about the, with the relationship with the Ukraine. My point is that they're referendums which are somehow claiming a democratic right to speak. Um, so there's a broader question about democracy in the European Union. I guess it's a British professor, Colin Crouch, who uh, gave us the word of post-democracy which has been picked up in political science uh, for long. I think it's a good word, post-democracy is you can always vote, but you have no choice. So we give participatory sort of elements and we make them vote in the European Parliament, but still people have the feeling, although they vote, they have no impact to change policy. You can always vote, you have no choice. So this all has been described. Um, and it's pitiful because obviously it leads to that technocracy, which is the, um, the big sort of argument of the so-called populists which go against the Brussels technocracy. And you know, people saying this are actually not only populist. I would like to point to the title of uh, Jürgen Habermas, who's I think the most uh, important living German philosopher. The last book he published in April 2015, the title is The Lure of Technocracy. So pointing to the EU and saying the EU is undemocratic or post-democratic structure is not only a populist sort of fantasy, it is reality. So the problem is perhaps that the sort of um, center parties or the, the establishment parties are in denial of this and cannot basically accept that there is some truth in the post-democracy reproach. And so they are not reacting and therefore they are basically bashing these people. So what we are seeing here, I think in essence, is that, you, um, uh, that we are going back to a desire of, in the Rousseau sense, volonté de tous, voting by the feet. Uh, instead of holding volonté générale, which is representative democracy, but because representative democracy, volonté générale, is not providing answers for many, volonté de tous is coming up. The, the problem here, and I'm very serious about this, is we are all, I think, misled in wanting only more democracy for Europe. Obviously, we all want more democracy, but democracy as a notion doesn't stand alone. And we need to think that in the description of Aristoteles, democracy alone can always skip into <coughs> tyranny. What I mean is the majority of the street is no democracy. The majority of the street can be the mob who killed Socrates. And the moment we are framing, and there's a lot of left people who are framing more democracies, more participation, is more uh, uh, referenda, we may be really misleading because, again, the majority of the street is no democracy because democracy is always has always a normative binding and is the right to protect against arbitrage government, right? And there's a very important definition here to look for. Mm. Oh, so, my place, just to think one second. Yes. So, um, I mean, what, what I, I agree with, with some aspects of what you said in particular. I mean, this, the fact of technocracy, for example. Um, I mean, seeing the things in context, in kind of broader context, which is the problem of technique as such, mm -hmm. which is identified about a hundred years ago, for example, um, even by controversial philosophers like you know, Heidegger or Junger, mm -hmm. in, in a different context. But that becomes kind of like the song of the age. And the song of the age then kind of translates also in terms of political, uh, you know, of, of political structures. Um, and in that sense, that's why I was talking about before the importance of imagination. Because the problem is not just simply one of political structures as such to be changed, but, this, but the cultural atmosphere that we're living in. Oh. So the, you have on the one hand this kind of like, tech, this idea of technique, which kind of encompasses a lot of things, and then this kind of like mercantile nihilism, and when the two meet, um, so operating at the level of an imagination of kind of like changing the, the rhythm, you know, of, of this kind of like of the song of the world, that's very important. That's why when you were saying before, the triangulation has been between France, Germany, and Britain, 
that is that is correct. But that's probably also one of the reasons why there's been this kind of this kind of outcome because that has never included the South. The South, I think, culturally contains some very important antidotes I, I to this kind of derive, you know, yeah. this drift towards kind of mercantile nihilistic. Technique. And there is a Catholic <laughs> Protestant thing here, which we could uh, basically, in cultural terms, work on. But uh, one sentence only on this sort of why is this desire for referendum? The desire for referendum is precisely because with the existing system, even though you vote, you have no impact on changing whatever you want to change. So there is that catch-22 that under current condition we are basically not able to change European policies just because we um, constitutionalized basically liberal economics in the constitutional treaties set up and, uh, and it can not be changed, you know. Basically the golden rule which is uh, a no debt policy and the whole thing we did through the euro crisis, even if you have a, a, a social demonstration, so sort of if Martin Schulz had been elected to the European Parliament coming from the liberal or from the from the social democratic side, he could not have changed uh, policies in the European Union because he constitutionalized a certain economic policy, and I think this is the problem. When if, if when people have the feeling I can always vote, but this doesn't uh, impact on what is done, then I need a referendum to basically protest, and sure. that is the the trap we are in. Thank you. Let me let me let me um, just try and bring out the dimension of culture a little bit a little bit more because um, thankfully uh, not everything is decided by governments relationships between governments and treaties from the constitution there's also what we all individually do what social movements do what cultural actors do um, and I think in some way all of us around the table are working um, uh, partly to try and influence governments and, and political parties, but also with one foot in uh, active citizens, uh, citizens' movements and so on. And so let's maybe think a little bit about uh, this paradox that at the same moment that uh, the European Union seems to be uh, blocked or very difficult to change uh, through the institutions, there has been uh, some elements of uh, people coming to the rescue, if one looks quite literally coming to the rescue when it comes to migrants uh, arriving, European Union incapable of coming up with any policy, people have stepped in and come to the rescue. Uh, there are other ways in which citizens are uh, mobilizing and organizing themselves to make another Europe possible on the ground. Uh, maybe James, since momentum has, has got this uh, place between the political parties and the movements, I, I don't think that, that that is a paradox. I think um, what, we're, what we're seeing within uh, you know, faith in the European institutions and the European system more broadly, which isn't just the institutions but its set of economic relations and so on, uh, is, um, and the, the loss of faith in that is the same as we're seeing the loss of faith with, within member states, within, the, with, within systemic parties and within uh, an understanding that the system as a whole is, is fair. And I think that opens up these potentials that we're, that we're seeing. And it's exactly the same thing we're seeing in, in Britain or Greece or Germany or elsewhere. We're seeing on the European, the European scale where um, we don't feel like we have sufficient ownership in the system. Now, that doesn't mean that we are anti-European. It doesn't mean that we don't want, uh, that we're, we're anti our country or anything else. But it means that we don't trust the elites that are running the system to do it functioning on our behalf, which causes these, these movements to rise up. And I think uh, the thing that we need to do is try to help those movements along, to help them to be organised so they're not just these spontaneous uprisings which then go, go back down into the general citizenry, but have some kind of organisational form that can then begin to link up. Because um, the same forces that are animate, or to some extent the same forces that are animating people helping migrants them, themselves are the same forces that are animating the right populist anti-European forces. And there needs to be ways in which those anti-systemic movements can speak to each other. Of course, we've got the key problem of, of xenophobia. How do, we, how, do we breach, how do we breach this problem? Which is also, I think, why uh, it's uh, perhaps a slight tangent, but the Commonwealth point for Britain, I think, is particularly important. How does how does a how does a, a British left build uh, something that is is very British, is rooted in people's communities, is part of a sense of belonging, but also deals with the fact that British identity tends to you know has historically been set up in very very violent ways against people from elsewhere. 
I think that, well, I have to talk about Greece as well at this point, because that's what we saw in Greece and Spain in particular, with the Indignados movement, which the protest movements, they come up. But from there, you have different parties emerging in a different way. Syriza took a lot of that energy and translated into the electoral victory, and Podemos actually created a party which is much closer connected with um, the movements. So I think what we are um, called to do in this situation, and I think that's why I find momentum so important, is that we are trying to bridge these different social sites and find uh, ways to link them together. And I think this, we have to think of that on a national level. For example, having um, organizations like Momentum that they uh, mediate, let's say, between the movements and the party, but also on transnational level, how we are going then to create uh, coalitions that they will fight for changes in Europe and so on. So if at some point somebody will ask, okay, how are you going to go about making these changes? It will be the linking between these different levels and trying to create broader alliances beyond nation state within the European Union and try to change the circumstances and the, the, the conditions of power that we find in there. I'm picking up on this because I agree with James, you know, uh, the, what is lacking here is the trust that the uh, ruling class governs well for the well of all people, right? And that's why we see all these movements and uh, there is a, uh, the, the very fair point, but the, the question is then, and it's a, I, I just put a question mark, why this transnational gathering of sort of more progressive forces um, um, uh, is so difficult, because what we see is that basically the transnational gathering of the right-wingers is just underway. Uh? They, they have a strong capacity to even then organize transnationally, mm -hmm. um, and they can basically play at both sides, because they can organize the street in Germany, like Pegida, or in you know, like in France, and uh, but they can also do the transnational cooperation. And um, the problem I see for this, uh, how the, how would you work on sort of uh, um, um, my English is lacking, but uh, sort of uh, link the the, the different uh, movements is the the tendency to uh, say that um, through more stakeholder participation and deliberative momentums you earn democracy, I think this is also wrong. You, you see my point? There, there is this, it's very important because we, we are, there, there are many forces already out there. There's an anti-TTIP, whatever you see. But still there is a lack of relay with the system because the system is not really reacting to all these. Uh, so the moment you play a uh, more or less confrontational line, even though there is a lot of out there, you still cannot bridge the um, sort of the impact of all these movements into <coughs> real politics. FTTIP is a very good example that you have a huge protest wave there, but it doesn't seem to bother the people who are running the negotiations. So uh, I'm just putting a question mark. I mean, about the kind of impotence of politics to a certain extent, that's, uh, I mean, I think that's also the, the big lesson of Obama himself, you know, the yeah. idea that the President of the United States has to say, yes, we can. It's obvious. I mean, he's the president of the United States, but I mean, it would be. But actually, he, he can't. He yeah. couldn't do anything. Which now is a consolation because if Trump wins, then I'm very happy that he cannot. <laughs> but the, the difference, in a way, between Trump and Obama is that Trump kind of acts at a different level as well, which is a cultural level. Which is where I want to go back to that to a certain extent. Because, for example, when we look at the idea of helping migrants, I mean, why? What are the kind of like? mental conceptual basis for people to go and help in migrants. Well, we could have an idea that, you know, they do it because out of empathy or pity or this kind of like mm -hmm. sad passions, you know, this kind of cheap sentimentalism. Or we could have an idea that that is because there is an understanding of human life as innately worth it, you know, like something that has a worth in itself. Now, this, is, this kind of line is the opposite of the other two European options that we have at the moment. To, to, to be in a brutal way, like the, we have the kind of like... Um, the neoliberalism and fascism are the two options here on the table. I mean, unless we insert a third one. Uh, fascism is the idea that, you know, the worth of people is because of their belonging or the name, the flag they have. And, you know, the, the modern type kind of neoliberal is what they call mercantile nihilism, the fact that, you know, your worth is depending on your value as a productive device. Um, and these are very central European, you know, these are very kind of northern European. This is the kind of a northern European dialectic. Now, the idea of inserting a look at the South, because we're talking about the migrants, what do all these migrants also come in culturally? Well, they, come, they bring in a different imagination, which is that of 
that has roots in antiquity, for example, uh, from which the Renaissance came out. And, and a lot of things, it's been like an undercurrent that has remained in European intellectual history. Um, that's what I call, for example, you know, humanism. And um, I think that also allows us, in terms of imagination, to understand that Europe is not just a, um, a territorial contiguity of, of countries, but is a cultural area which already, always already includes North Africa, always already includes Iran, always already includes Syria. I mean, we have de developed a discussion together, especially in late antiquity. I mean, the, the way in which we had medieval philosophies through a collaboration mm -hmm. with, with Arabic culture. This is completely forgotten. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why also in England you teach philosophy starting from Kant, basically, mm -hmm. and before it's kind of tabula rasa. Mm -hmm. Mara Nostro, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm going to come back again to, the, to, the, to these broader cultural points in a moment, but maybe James first. Well, just about building a, a transnational movement where it starts. I think it, to build a European movement from Britain is to build a movement in Britain that then links up with others and build a European movement. I don't think it can work the other way around because um, there isn't the frame of reference, I think, for, uh, for people to work. Likewise, to build a north-south, as in global south-north um, movement, it can't, it can't start from that perspective in order to um, gain the largest currency. So I think it's about um, uh, linking up activism here and making it uh, and creating a transnational frame. So, for example, tax havens. Right? Everybody hates tax havens and the representation of um, uh, uh, corporate and financial power that that suggests. And if you can link up the campaigns here, you know, why is it that um, there are, you know, why is it that there are cuts? Well, we're not getting money through uh, through taxes. If you can link that up to, well, the only way we can deal with this is if we do things on a European scale. Of course, Britain can do lots of things. It controls lots of tax havens. We need to do a lot of work here, but also we need to work with to to deal with the question of Luxembourg and and uh, and the Netherlands and Ireland. And we can only do this on a European scale. But also, it's the same thing with uh, Commonwealth countries. I think part of the reason why. Uh, costs of housing, there's a housing crisis. Part of the reason is um, uh, influx of um, illicit financial flows from countries in the global south via, via tax havens. Part of the struggles in Nigeria are actually very much linked to housing struggles here. And I think if you, you can start with the housing, uh, the housing struggle here and then you link them out and you build those alliances, then I think that's how we start to build a new international movement that has a very strong European focus rather than the other way around. I, I, want, to, I want to pick up on this theme of um, slightly broader geopolitical considerations actually. One of the interesting things with the moment of having a referendum in the UK is firstly that the UK is uh, quite a diverse society, quite, has historically been quite open, even if there have been moments when it's become quite close, but there's a lot of different people from different uh, parts of the world here in the UK. Um, and so even talking about the UK population, one has to bring in already the Commonwealth dimension, one has to bring in um, all kinds of different cultural backgrounds, I and mean, here we are sitting in London after all. But also, um, the UK certainly likes to think of itself, and certainly is to some extent, uh, a bridge with um, the, the, the United States of America, uh, the Americas more generally. Um, uh, it's an important uh, nuclear power. And so this referendum um, has implications for Europe, but it also has uh, implications for uh, geopolitics more broadly. And it's fascinating that uh, amongst the, the partners of the UK, um, almost everybody is desperate for the UK to stay in the European Union. One looks at the messages coming from uh, North America, and it's been said that the one person who would be happy if the UK leaves would be Vladimir Putin, yeah. uh, which gives you some sense of the geopolitical uh, status of all this. And so, um, I mean, the, the, the cultural question is, is quite immediately also a geopolitical question. So I'd be interested if we had shared some thoughts about the geopolitical significance of this, of this decision, actually, when it comes to security, uh, when it comes to the West, the future of the Occident. As James said earlier, I think it would just leash things which probably we cannot even foresee. Yeah, I mean, 
uh, you know, uh, we didn't foresee the 9-11 follow-up, we didn't foresee sort of what uh, German unification did over time, and to think that we control this, I think it's just cognitively wrong. We may have an idea what, what happens, but the domino effects of, and, and where the domino falls in this side or this side, who would like to predict? So uh, the unleashing of sort of energy things uh, is the first, and, and then to see who arranges, is this good for Putin and bad for the US, you know, and, and then in addition to all the other big changes, I mean, there is a true question about who becomes the next American president, which is a very important question, which would make a difference. So, you know, then you have uh, various variables, you know, Brexit with uh, Clinton and Brexit with Trump, and you know, how, how are these variables falling together? So. Um, then we have two other variables which I would like to see in, in, in connection because Brexit but a good German election with less AfD and uh, no Marine Le Pen in France might still be doable, but Brexit in addition to a very nasty result in France next year, in addition to a very nasty German result in the general elections, might give a different trigger. So I think this is um, really uh, very difficult to uh, assess what could be the, the, the potential unleashing and how quick a domino effect could go from a Brexit, which we probably would not control. Can we say something on that? Because it was a big issue with Greece in there, sorry James. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because what amazed me when we had the discussion with the negotiations with Greece and the European Union last year is that geopolitics and the position of Greece was never coming into discussion. So you had part of the left which was saying, oh, but Greece, you should go out of the European Union without any consideration of how this will translate in terms of geopolitics, the outer uh, borders of Europe and so on. So I think we, what we have to do is bring these discussions in because since I was following that with the Greek situation, it wasn't part of the debate. As, as you said, we don't know what exactly the effects will be, and you cannot predict everything um, in a certain way. But I think when we are in Britain and we are discussing the sort of changes, we have to bring the geopolitics into the discussion. And, and can one sentence, but I mean, we have the, the European forthcoming council now, mm -hmm. uh, the day after tomorrow, and this decision Seven, to yeah. basically do the camp building in Greece, you know, which is basically mm -hmm. leading now to a solution which is obviously not voiced, but uh, let's give some money to the Greek, but then leave them alone with the refugees is uh, sort of the subtext mm -hmm. which is uh, Play displaying here, and uh, to what it could lead is actually that Greek becomes a new Lebanon in the European Union, yes. and then I can already see the German voices that such a country <coughs> may need to leave, and you get a Brexit on top. So uh, we, I, I think there's so many variables in the equation that uh, exactly, yeah. And and I was amazed as I told you that when we had the negotiations, none of this uh, was discussed, and I think we should bring in this discussion what is happening right now with the refugee crisis and seventh mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. March and what is our vision in relation to that as well. I, I, I think, of course, we don't know how it's going to go, but we, as you were saying earlier, we know the potentiality is inscribed within it, and they are very, very bad. I mean, if you... Maybe let's not get too focused on the apocalyptic scenarios. I mean, I, I, sure. I think it's good to, to keep them in mind, okay. but let's also think about what positively could come out of uh, this, well, this could, current moment. Uh, uh, what, uh, uh, what positive could come out of a Brexit? I mean, it... You, no, no, I mean, if, 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 the, if, the, if the UK were to vote to stay in, mm -hmm. uh, what possible reconfigurations could that also lead to? So, I mean, let's, let's try and keep a little bit of balance between the apocalypse okay, and... Okay, yes, yeah, yeah. If you think of that in terms of a relationship, though, it's like, oh, you know, like, you know you, you're my partner, and be like, no, I'm going to break up with you. And then, like, no, I'm actually not. I mean, is that going to improve our relationship? Well, probably not, even uh, if we stay together. The, uh, okay, so the, the, the positive <laughs> dimension, I think, is that um, uh, June, if uh, in vote, remain vote, June 24th gives us a very big option to change what the European debate is. So, you know, if we've been talking about it, we've got, uh, currently you've got conservatism of some sort versus reaction, the, the sort of high point of British engagement that you, that you referred to sort of 15 years ago was, um, was uh, social liberal with sort of fairly hardcore neoliberalism, you know, these are, this is all that's, that's been available. And the, this debate between the conservative Okay, we, it doesn't matter what the word is, but that and the and the reactionary, it's, if Remain wins, that will discombobulate them. It will fracture the debate somewhat, and they will continue to argue, and they won't be able to state what Britain and Europe is now and what Europe is now. And I think that provides the opportunity for more progressive forces, more social forces, to map out. Uh, 
pan-European alliances to map out what our, what our possible future could be. So there are, it, it does provide an opportunity, but I think the opportunity isn't in the next few weeks. It's what comes directly afterwards that, that, that could catalyse something new. And tell me positive. Um, I wanted to say something about this kind of geopolitical angle to it. One, one typical left criti uh, left wing critique to Europe, which is absolutely legitimate, is that you know, for example, the European project has some imperial aspects to it, um, which is you know fair enough. Um, it does. I mean, uh, kind of like every state form has some imperial elements to it, unless it becomes completely like prison unto itself. When you were talking about the specificity, like for example, Britain being an open like a country that is open. I would tend to disagree um, because there are different mo imperial models. Like, for example, imagining two in particular. There's the British model, which is one in which, uh, which is based on some sort of like ethnically based class caste system, in which this Britain has its colonial empire, right, which is this kind of outpost of, of exploitation with kind of genocidal tendencies in, in all of them usually, with no territorial contiguity, no common identity. You could be a, a Gurkha fighting for Britain 50 years, then you come here and you're like, you know. Never British. Then you would have a different idea, which is, for example, that of the Roman Empire, which is an idea of an expansion in which, eventually, by the second century, basically all of the Roman emperors were foreigners. You know, were from the Middle East, from from Germany, from Pannonia, or whatever you want to call it. These are two, uh, two completely different, two completely different ideas of, of empire. So yes, there have been always lots of people from all over the world in Britain, but from that idea of empire, right? The other kind of tendency, which is an imperialistic tendency, it is undeniable. But I think the European project looks more towards that kind of Roman kind of attitude, which is different. But the, so just said that, because the, the European project, we have to acknowledge that. Sure, uh, I mean, in one scenario, the slaves were eventually liberated, in one they were not. So there, I mean, there are also some, some differences between a Roman Empire and a British Empire, right? Well, yeah, but I mean, it's different. I mean, it is, it is from that kind of attitude, that kind of like post-Hellenistic attitude in which, you know, like Syrians and, and Italians and Germans could move together that came out those ideas also embodied in Christianity, which, uh, which were the basis on which the slaves were liberated afterwards. The slaves were liberated afterwards on, on the basis of the ideas that came out of that type of kind of like melting pot, this mestizage, you know, the kind of like the mixing. They weren't inscribed necessarily in the British. I mean, we have to see things in perspective. But there is one, one aspect, which is um, the, the idea of European integration and expansion, which I see as including Northern Africa and, and, and the Middle East, does go towards the idea of a kind of like of a world state eventually, which on, on environmental grounds is inevitable at some point. I think that you know this thing that scares a lot of people that are attached to the idea, of, for example, of the small community that you you know. Um, I think it might be misguided because there is a paradoxical nature also to this kind of a huge um, political conglomerate. Paradoxically, they do allow inside greater freedom than the small ones. Think of living in a small town or in a huge city. In a small town, you know, everybody's looking onto each other. There's kind of like general policing. In a big town, like in the Ottoman Empire, you know, there's this kind of level of disintegration, the impossibility of control that allows for greater freedom. So I think we should see in this expansion. So some much more emancipatory, uh, in practice, maybe emancipatory possibilities than in the idea of the small community. So, some sorts of some sorts of freedom. Though. I mean, there's the there's the the freedom from people knowing your business, but there's also the freedom to have someone who you can knock on the door and they'll look after your kids if you if you're going out for the evening, or mm. um, uh, if you lose your job, uh, a security net that you can fall back on. I think actually, if we're going to build this. Uh, you know, the emancipatory, uh, emancipatory thing, it needs to be doing both things. It's the idea of cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism that it isn't antithetical to um, a, a social rootedness. It doesn't have to be a rootedness necessarily in soil and flag and necessarily in geography, but one that does construct a society where people are, have so, you know, are socially related to each other rather than we are all wonderful cosmopolitan individuals within a broader um, within a, this sort of broader space. I, I it depends how you, how you relate to each other, if it's on the basis of the fact that you're an individual, like you're a singularity like me, or the, the fact that you are white. You know, I mean, that's, that's, that's the big difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, cosmopolitanism, which has a very bad name at the moment, mm -hmm. but does contain certain elements that allow for social Yes, no, I agree, but, but that's okay. what I mean. It has to be the cosmopolitanism that is, that, that is also rooted in 
social form, not just not just an individual cosmopolitan. Rooted cosmopolitanism. I, 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 oh, no, okay. Rooted cos. I, I, I would perfectly agree with James because, and, and I would suggest, and that's why I basically wrote my book about European Republic because res publica is the public good, and uh, it's 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 basically translated into Commonwealth in the tradition of the liberal thinkers in the UK. Uh, and it's unfortunate that the Commonwealth as a name became only that Commonwealth empire. Yeah, but in the initial sense from Platon, Aristoteles and so, res publica would mean commonwealth. And you can do a lot of sort of, uh, you know, the republic is not ethnical and never was. The republic is normative, has a sort of normative economic grounding, would offer what you suggest, which is the social sort of embodiment, and it's not state integrating, but uniting people. Whenever people wanted to unite in a political entity in the European idea sphere, they created republics. And that's why I tried to choose the Republican idea for the next political project, because the next political project of Europe is political or is not. We will no longer <coughs> run around with a single market which doesn't offer a thing other than a single market. So we need to think politics again. And the framing of how do we think politics again in the European Union that offers a social grounding and a more than a market, but more than democracy, because again, democracy is not only the majority of the street. I just felt like the, the, the notion of Republica, Res Publica, Commonwealth, could be the intellectual framing of the project we are striving for. The last, and last, last uh, <laughs> moments I want, I want of this. I wanted to come on populism, because you, you you're going to have the, the You're going to have the chance, because the last oh, moments okay. of this discussion, which we need to close uh, shortly, I want to dedicate to this question of class. Uh, actually, which has been mentioned a couple of times, and it's clearly um, in the UK debate a very important uh, element, uh, as it remains an important element of UK society, actually, the dimension of class. And it's one that's particularly uh, difficult to talk about without sounding scary to some, class warfare, for example, scary terms, but maybe justified sometimes. Um, so how can we uh, build a European narrative? We've already had some uh, elements of it, perhaps. How can we build a European narrative which uh, takes into account this dimension of class, doesn't simply speak to elites in sometimes abstract and philosophical terms? First of all, we have to rethink what class is, and then you will go back to the debate that it started in the 70s, about which then was taken up by Blairites, the critique that you had of class as well, because now we see new classes emerging. It's the, the refugees the unemployed, the people on part-time contracts, the constitution I mean, of class has changed and we have uh, to think of that as well. That's why I wanted to say something about populism when you were talking about populism, because you were talking about right-wing populism. And I come from a tradition that populism is a political logic, it can apply both to left and right, and it goes beyond class and it talks about how we can unite the people the people of Europe, let's say, in, in the debate that we are having against something that will be the particular enemy. So I, I would like to take back the, uh, the concept of populism and to apply it to the politics that we have right now across Europe, the new parties that they are emerging, that they go beyond the working class in the traditional Marxist sense, but they're trying to create a people on national level, but also this on a European level. Okay, let's, let's go around the table. <laughs> Federico. Uh, I am very um, skeptical of this kind of, like, of, the, of the innately positive aspects of identification with one's community or identity and stuff, but also apply to class. I think we should remember that the point of class is to try to class as a set of, uh, as, a, as a position of disadvantage for the vast majority of classes, is to overcome the idea of class. And the same, I think, should apply to the idea of identity in that sense. Overcoming, going beyond this, like, rather than identify in a kind of panicked and, you know, re-territorialized, as I would say, kind of um, rigid aspect onto the idea of class and protecting uh, the working class, but moving beyond the idea of class. That, once again, I think is the, the potential of that atmosphere that I call the atmosphere of the South, you know, the, the humanistic atmosphere, this idea of overcoming. James, James. Um, I think that um, class has to come very much back into it, but I think it should come back in in a practical way rather than in a sort of building a, 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 an intellectual discourse way. So um, uh, activists here in the UK, say, who want to, should be active on class issues, if you take the city that we're living in, one of the, if not the, depending on your perspective, but one of the biggest issues is housing and the cost of housing and the quality of housing. 
So I would suggest that the way in which to build this, eventually, this populist Europe, which could then perhaps switch back into a, a kind of mass class Europe, uh, Europe, is to build these campaigns, to build these, let's say, tenants' unions and so on, and then to look around and see the same struggles are going on in Madrid, the same struggles are going on in Barcelona, they're going on in Paris, and to then link them up. And I think from that ground up, we start to then build this new place. We, this is a huge, very long-term project. The idea that we can tinker with some institutional ar arrangements within the EU and in 10 years' time will have some kind of social, democratic, um, uh, populist Europe is I, it's, it's, it's fantasy land. I think we need to start by building up, linking together all of these different movements, these different activists with a very clear um, uh, uh, class, but also transnational perspective. And I, I think from there, that's where another Europe and another world starts to become possible. Thank you. Ulrike, you have the privilege of having the closing words. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Nicola, I think first there is class warfare. Uh, what we lost is framing it in that way, uh, because it's no longer with Sartre talking mm -hmm. to the uh, Renault workers, right? Because there are no more workers. I mean, this is the deindustrialization thing, so I think in sociology this has been pretty and much analyzed and discussed that uh, sort of the organization mm -hmm. capacity of workers is no longer there because the sentiment that they feel like a class which could organize and should organize is no longer there. Obviously we are doing this, sociology also tells us that we are having the discourses to train these people that they need to be employable and we have we have basically changed the wording which mm -hmm. is if they are not succeeding it's their failure and it's not the failure of society. So there's a huge shift in the way we frame these things and obviously uh, education I think is it because we are losing on the educational ground uh, in all societies in, 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 in Europe and without education you can cannot build discourses so easily. So uh, how to get out of this? I think uh, there is a strong claim to make for education and for um, education first, critical theory first, and uh, to for, for enabling basically emancipatory discourses. Um, but uh, honestly, I have no idea how we come over the um, uh, the, uh, the very fact that progressive discourses were never so much appealing to, um, to, to the lower classes. I mean, this is an old phenomenon, yeah? And this is why the street, if we are reasoning in who wins the street in Europe today, the street always goes to the populist, yeah? To populist, to last, last sentence, I basically do not like the word populist because I think what is going really wrong when we discuss democracy in Europe is the normative high ground that people tend to have when they talk about the so-called populist. I would argue that these people have been neglected in the first place that they have fair claims and that democracy as such is that is the respect of the argument of the other. The moment the sort of uh, uh, um, ruling class in, in, in Europe comes with this sort of, oh, this chaos troops of Pegida, we do, you know, which is a non-respectful way of disregarding their arguments, democracy as such is lost because democracy, I think, as long as the arguments are not obvious xenophobia and the thing you need to draw a clear line, I think democracy starts with the respect and not a normative high ground towards the um, um, uh, uh, pop, so-called populist because you cannot say in theory that because somebody is not of the opinion of the governing elites that this person is a populist, right? But this is what we are seeing in many of the discourses. So I think we, we would really need to differentiate um, and in a way uh, if we could be successful, and that's what I'm trying in the European democracy, that we are just trying to build a strategy how we can build a discourse platform with, say, the Pegida youth, yeah? Not ex exclusion, I think, is the first wrong step. So uh, in, in the really concrete activism, that's what we are seeking for is, can we discuss with them? Can we create a forum where we invite these people to come in and say, look, where does your resentment come from? Where does your resentment and your whatever violence come from? from and this is the hope to cross benching. So okay. I, shall I end with a request? Uh, quickly. A discussion on populism some other day? Absolutely great. I don't think we're going to indeed resolve the no, question of the nature complex. of popular power around this uh, table here. Three messages which I think have come out quite clearly which are relevant to the UK uh, referendum are firstly that um, the uh, struggle to create an alternative Europe is 
uh, not going to end, that's for sure, with the 23rd of June uh, vote. That might be uh, a moment for a new beginning or a continuation of the struggle. Secondly, uh, that uh, we need to situate what's going on in the UK and indeed in Europe in a much wider geopolitical uh, uh, sense and continually integrate that into our discussions. And thirdly, and that's where I think we closed, that we need to be very attentive um, as those pushing for progressive change to the uh, demands, interests, and understandings of lots of people who feel totally excluded uh, from um, elitist discussions or uh, political parties, institutions, and so on. Um, so I think with those uh, three messages, we need, to, we need to close this discussion. If you've enjoyed this discussion about Talk Real, I would uh, hope that you would subscribe to the YouTube channel. You might also consider uh, subscribing, joining up to European Alternatives, uh, which you can do also on this page. Um, and we hope to see you next time at Talk Real. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.